Our listeners know only rage, and they seek only oblivion. Our podcast may be the only object on earth that may grant them peace. So let the geek history lesson on Dr. Fate be now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Onks Inman. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or mystical being from pop culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour. And today we are doing a lesson on a James Bond. What? A James Bond. Because he's played by Pierce Brosnan. I mean, only in one appearance, but like you really, only, threw, you only, really, you threw me in a hard left turn only there. Only in the one that most people are going to know him. There from. was a brief moment where I was like, "Does Ashley even know what day it is?" Yeah. <laughs> like, we are definitely doing Doctor Fate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have any at the time of this recording. Uh, again, this podcast is in the honor of the new Black Adam movie, which Doctor Fate makes an appearance in. So we thought we would open up the magical doors. And talk about Dr. Fate, Mm -hmm. Uh, because when else are we going to do it? Uh, This lesson has been suggested by a bunch of our listeners. Uh, Ashley, and where can they suggest future lessons if they care to? You can suggest future lessons at facebook.com slash geek history lesson on Twitter at GHL podcast. That's actually the best place to do it. And on Instagram at geek history lesson. This lesson was suggested by a story in the end. Thomas P. Williams, Alec Isn Bowen, Cindy Schoderwerden, Michael Emery, James Birmingham, Grod Frankenstein, and Kyle Davis. Uh, And I also want to give a big shout out uh, because some additional research and writing was done on this episode by the great Diego Nunez, our research assistant. So big shout out to Diego there. All right, Ashley, I think it is time to move into... The Tencent Origin. Ooh, is Dr. Strange going to join us? The first part of the podcast where we tell you uh, Jason's going to break down all the who's it's and what's it's galore in case you don't know anything about Dr. Fader. All you know, he's that he's got that sick helmet. And if you go to a cool like JSA themed cocktail party, you'll know what you're talking about. We should say at this point that uh, we should we have not seen the Black Adam movie nope. at this point. There, there will be no there will be no Black spoilers. Adam spoilers. We're just talking about Dr. Fate in the comic books and various things. And also to allude to something that Ashley said, I mean, there might be an appearance by a Dr. Strange, mm-hmm. but maybe not the Doctor Strange, and you got to stick around all the way to the end to figure out what that means. What does that even mean? The Tencent origin of Doctor Fate. He, of course, is a DC Comics character. His first appearance was in More Fun Comics number 55 in May of 1940. So he is a Golden Age character, and I just want to point out here that we need more comic books called stuff like More Fun Comics. That is a great title, and there were 55 issues of it! I agree. And, you know, if you were especially they had maybe, a lot of fun, maybe interested in building out your uh, YA all ages imprint because it was your best selling thing, that would be a great title to use. More fun comics. 55 issues. Actually, we do a quick Google. Tell me how many issues more fun comics ran. Through, and I will keep going in the tense and order. Great. Thank you. He, of course, was created by Gardner Fox and Howard Sherman. Now, there have been several Dr. Fates. I'm going to give you some in-story information right now uh, about the main Dr. Fate, which, of course, is Kent Nelson, who is who I believe Pierce Brosnan is playing in the Black Adam movie. Uh, Kent Nelson's team affiliations were the All-Star Squadron, the Justice Society of America, the Lords of Order, the Justice League Dark, the Justice League, the Justice League International, and the Sentinels of Magic. His partnerships have been with Inza Nelson, Naboo, and Khalid Nassour. His abilities, of course, are he has a master of magic. He is sort of immortal. He is limited in vulnerability. He is proficient in jujitsu. He's a skilled physician and archaeologist, and he has access to mystical articles such as the Helmet of Fate, the Amulet of Anubis, and the Cloak of Destiny, which I will tell you what each of those do a little bit further down the line. Two things. One, limited vulnerability means you're not invulnerable. Yep. Uh, and I have the answer for more fun comics whenever you many? How much fun did they have? So it was alternately monthly and bi-monthly. So it appears like it was sort of six months monthly, six months bi-monthly. That's fine. Um, ran for 12 years, 127 issues. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much fun. 127 more fun installations comics. of fun. Uh, Dr. Fate, of course, has been portrayed in multiple iterations he has been played uh in live action did you know that 
Black Adam is not the first live action appearance of Dr. Fate. Uh, you do know? Yes, I did know that. Do you know where he appears? No. He appears on Smallville. Should have guessed Smallville. Uh, played by Brent State. Uh, with a very plasticky looking helmet, but it's pretty cool that he shows up. Uh, he's played by Odair Fair in Justice League and Justice League Unlimited and Superman the Animated Series. And he is played by Ent Ed Asner as Kent Nelson and Kevin Michael Richardson as Naboo in Young Justice. Oh, cool. And then, of course, as Ashley alluded to earlier, James Bond, Pierce Brosnan in the upcoming Black Adam movie. Or it's out right now if you're you know listening to this Hello, in the future. Hello, future people. Now let's get to the meet cute. Which is the second part of the podcast where we tell you the first time we meet this character and how cute it was. Now, research assistant Diego has said, I've always felt like I've seen the image of the Helmet of Fate all my life. My actual introduction to the character was most likely his parents in the Justice League of the Animated Series, which mm-hmm. is probably pretty commonplace. Ashley, where did you first meet it and cute it? Dr. Fate. Definitely uh, the Justice League the Animated Series. I had never heard of Dr. Fate before then. Um, I thought he looked cool, but... That was pretty much my entire experience of Dr. Fate until uh, the new, younger, I believe Egyptian version of him was introduced in the DCYOU. Yes, that is Khalid. Yeah, he's cool, man. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say I, I've always had a passing familiarity with Dr. Fate. But how about you, Wizard Magazine? Wizard Magazine. No. Wow, tell me. So there was in the mid to late 90s, um, sometimes DC and Marvel would give out little tiny booklets. Oh, yes. With other comic books. Mm-hmm. And during the zero hour event, which is one of my favorite events, they did all zero issues of the comic book. So every DC comic got a really cool cover and got a zero issue. And they were all meant to be jumping on points. Mm-hmm. In this booklet, they showed you all the covers of all the zero issues and they had black and white pictures of all the covers. And one of the issues that was being rebooted during that was a comic book called fate. Mm. Now this fate was a big guy with a knife and a mullet and an ox on his face. And he was the new fate, Mm. not Dr. Fate. He was fate. And we're going to talk about him in a little bit later. Okie dokie. But that was my first introduction to who a supposed Dr. Fate was. It was this guy, Fate. 90s. Big we love, we love to see it. Uh, I want to give everybody some fun facts about Dr. Fate before we get too deep into the History 101 and the multiple iterations of Dr. Fate. Because we are going to cover, we're going to cover Kent. But Dr. Fate also has been portrayed by a lot of different hosts. So Okie dokie. Here's some fun facts about Dr. Fate. All-Star Squadron number 47 is an 80s secret origin issue of Dr. Fate. And it also happens to be one of uh, Todd McFarlane's first comic book works. Ooh. Uh, Kent Nelson, the main uh, avatar of Dr. Fate, is considered to be the most powerful magic user in the DC universe. Mm-hmm. Although his wife, Inza Kramer, who we're going to get to, is considered to be more talented as a magic user than Kent. Now, I just want to say, Ashley. Typical wife. (laughs) I mean, does a doctor who is considered to be the most powerful magic user and his wife who considered to be the most talented Mm -hmm. seem kind of familiar? I don't know. Maybe I'm looking into this. Yeah, you might be reading it a little too much. Uh, Isna, his wife, uh, Inza, excuse me, who has been... You know, known throughout the golden age as Inza Kramer, Inza Sanders, and Inza Kramer Karmer again, uh, finally was settled on as Inza Kramer in the Silver Age. So okay, okay. they could not decide what her last name was throughout the golden age, and nobody cared. And also, sadly, uh, Kent Nelson is allergic to bees. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> Okay. Doesn't really apply to any of these stories, but it is noted in one of the stories that he is allergic to bees. I mean, bees just gonna be bees, man. That's right. <laughs> that- and they share his colors. <laughs> Listen, Dr. Fate, he can take down the specter, but if you have a bead near him. I'm imagining him like trying to mentor the Teen Titans one day and Bumblebee shows up and he's like, Aah! 
<laughs> and just like runs for the hill. And she's like, what? <laughs> and then like, this dude has literally fought the specter to a standstill. And he's like, ah, oh, bees. He's like, ah! I mean, I guess not to like dunk on the I'm allergic to bee representation in comics, but like, okay. Yep. So there you go. That there's, is a fun fact. It's truly a fun, delightful fact. All right, so let's get into this history 101 section on Dr. Fate. We're going to dive deeper into Dr. Fate. We're going to have a great conversation. Again, we're covering multiple Dr. Fates, not just Kent, but we're going to talk about Kent the most because he's the guy in the Black Adam movie, as far as I know. Uh, but we just want to throw out there, we're also going to cover some of the most powerful magic users in the DC universe. That is this week's Geek History Lesson Extra episode over on the Patreon. We're going to rank the most powerful magic users in the DC universe. It's a lot like this uh, episode of Except We Curse. So if you want to hear that, head on over to patreon.com slash Jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. We have four bonus episodes of Geek History Lesson Extra every single month. We do Marvel Club and we do two episodes a month of Jason and Jeremy John about Justice League. So... If you want to hear lots more podcasts, that's where you want to. Also, that's where you get ad-free episodes of Geek History Lesson. You don't hear commercials during Geek History Lesson. That's where you go. So uh, I just want to throw out final month of Marvel Club is this month. Yeah. It's your last chance to sign up for the special offer and get the Sarah Lover Miles Morales Spider-Man print that completes the tri-image art prints of Doctor Strange. Thor and Spidey looks absolutely magical. That is for everybody at the Marvel Club level and above over at the Patreon. So check it out at patreon.com slash Jawin, J-W-I-I-N. And thanks to all the super friends that support us over there. Can I uh, interject very quickly? I just Googled the Dr. Fate Smallville to see what the costume looks like. Yeah. What do you think? He looks Awesome. He looks pretty good. In live, when you see him moving around, he looks a little plasticky. Um, he has a very prominent cod piece. Uh, you can tell the helm is made of plastic, but it still looks pretty mm-hmm. cool. And he's from uh, Absolute Justice, which I've actually seen and is uh, a pretty good episode. It is a, it's, with Stargirl. Might be the best episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised with how cool because, you know, about half the time you look at Smallville costumes, and you're like, how street level is this going to look? I and he looks pretty cool. He does look pretty cool. And I he is he's very short, the actor, but he does a pretty good job. I, if I remember right, short I, king, I want to say in that episode, uh, Dr. Fate brings them to Clark because Dr. Fate has seen the destiny of the world and knows that Clark's going to be the world's greatest superhero. That sounds right to I me, think so. but it's been years since I've seen yeah, that episode. It's a good episode. Anyways, let's talk about Dr. Fate. Let's. Dr. Fate is a legacy character. What does that mean, Jason? Well, it means that there has been more than one person under the mantle of Dr. Fate. There have been a total of eight different characters that have been Dr. Fate, but we're only going to talk about the most important ones. Just to let you know, Dr. Fate is actually an entity that emerges when the wearer puts on the helmet of Naboo. He is an agent for the Lords of Order in the battle against the agents of chaos with the use of magical enchanted items, as I said before. The Lords of Order, just to let you know, are powerful, magical beings who manifested themselves as the first sentient race in the universe. They are a race of incorporeal magical beings who represent, you guessed it, order. They, Whoa! By the way, their favorite show is Law and Order. You should just know that. They love the dun-dun. Dun-dun. Anyways. <laughs> they bestow their nearly limitless power onto their selected agents to serve on their behalf. Now, some notable other agents of the Lords of Order, of course, like mm-hmm. Kent Nelson, the Doctor Fate, have also been Dove of Hawk and Dove, mm. the Phantom Stranger, Lord Amethyst, and even Power Girl. Who is Power Girl, Ashley? Power Girl is the uh, Earth to most of the time uh, counterpart of Supergirl. Yes. She she's is, great. She's Supergirl grown up, basically. Yeah, from Karen Starr. Now, the Lord of Order, the Lords of Order serve as a deterrent against the Lords of Chaos, who, of course, represent Hey, that chaos, makes sense. <laughs> and they, these act as the avatars of change during the Ninth Age of Magic in the DC Universe. Uh, the Lord of chaos their ultimate goal is to bring about kale yuga which is a term to describe a time when chaos reigns supreme how does it spelled k-a-l-i uh-huh you excuse me y-u-g-a interesting i was just wondering if it was a take on caligula but it seems like maybe not i don't know that's okay okay the agent some of the agents of the lord of chaos have been 
Clarin, the witch boy. I love him. Hawk of Hawk and Dove. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Eclipso. Yes. And a character known as Anti-Fate, who we will talk about later. Okay, that seems like a lazy naming convention. I can't wait. Well, (laughs) Anti-Fate shows up in the 80s, so there you go. Okay, okay. Uh, (laughs) Most of the Lords of Order are immensely powerful entities that are made up of in, of energy they consider themselves beyond sex and form which seems kind of boring if you think about it mm-hmm. and they rarely manifest into any physical form in fact it is said that the lords of order do not engage in procreation believing procreation to be an act that invites chaos i mean if you've ever listened to grant morrison talk about chaos magic maybe <laughs> now ashley i want to ask you yes do you think you would be chosen by the Lords of Order? No. Or the Lords of Chaos? The Lords of Chaos. Well, why? I'm a disaster. <laughs> They'd be like, order. It's it's why the same reason why I don't think I could be a Jedi. Um, I you heard Ashley say it here first. I don't think I have the discipline. I did not say it. Ashley said it. Or the, or the structure. But I have the magical thinking that I think the Lords of Chaos would be uh, into for sure. All right. That's why I wouldn't be a Green Lantern. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about Naboo. Oh, okay. So, so it's a, it's this planet, Nabu. right? No, and no. They no. elect their queen. No, and the Gungans live under the water. That's not it. Nabu, N A B U, not N A B O O. I know. I always spell the planet wrong. Uh, Nabu. Okay, uh, <laughs> is one of the lords of order. Yes. Now, Nabu is descended onto Earth during the times of ancient Egypt, and he became known as Nabu the Wise, serving as an advisor to Ramses. He became humbled after the specter killed Ramses for his treatment of the Hebrew people. That is a very famous story, of oh, course, wow. from Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Nabu, during this time, created the scarab of kaf Ethri in an attempt to overthrow Vandal Savage, an immortal being, mm-hmm. who was at the time a pharaoh called Khafri. Now, the scarab was lost and later discovered 4,500 years later by a gentleman and archaeologist known as Dan Garrett. Now, Ashley, that name should seem very familiar to you. Yep. Who is Dan Garrett? I'm... 80% sure he's the first Blue Beetle. You are correct. Of the Charleston Comics uh, era Blue he Beetle. He is the golden age Blue Beetle. Whoo! I was like, if he's not Blue Beetle, yep. I'm going to be so mad. Who gets his superpowers from that scarab, which that scarab later goes on to uh, be inherited by Jaime Reyes. Yes. Now, Nabu was on hand when a Thanagarian starship crashed, and he recovered a portion of the anti-gravity metal named Nth Metal, and Nabu and his ally, Teth Adam, used Nth Metal to forge a gauntlet called the Claw of Horus. Now, Teth Adam goes on to become a pretty important person in the DC universe, or as Dwayne Johnson would put it, he becomes someone who would change the hierarchy of power in the DC universe. It's Jason's favorite catchphrase of all time, if you can't tell from his tone. It's such a lazy catchphrase. I don't understand. But Ashley, who is Teth Adam, just in case the listeners don't know? Black Adam yep. with the pointy ears. And I think we should go ahead and announce it that next week's GHL is going to be about Black Adam. Spoiler. So there you go. So if you want to know more about Black Adam, we're going to talk a little bit about him, but this is about as much as we're going to touch on him here. I think that's fair. So Nabu with the alloy of the Nth Metal, and we should know that the Nth Metal of the Thangarians, they're hawk people. They're the Hawkmans. Yes. They're That's what they make. Sure. Yes. Every time he goes, hello, share my love. Kaka! Sure. Yeah, that's why they haven't made a Hawkman movie so far. I don't know if you know this. The reason why Hawkman hasn't appeared in the Justice League because they don't want to have scenes where they're like, hello, Superman. Ka-ka! I can't wait for Aldous Hodge to be doing that across all of the Black Adam movies. That's the reason why they cast him. He was the only one in the auditions that could handle. That committed to it. Uh, you, would, have you seen the clip of him doing the caca? Uh, no, I have not. But I will say that I, I watched him in uh, make, make Calypso uh-huh. a very deep and compelling performance as a single actor acting yes. against nothing. So I believe that man could do anything. We, there is a scene, they've released this clip <laughs> online at uh, dcuniverse.com uh, slash joke. And uh, <laughs> he's having a scene with Pierce Brosnan in the future Black Adam movie. Sure. And at one point he's just drinking a cup of tea and he just goes, caca. Mm, and it, sexy. it is um, I, I swear to God an Oscar winning performance you're, you're calling it right here Aldous Hodges Hawkman in Black Adam first best, best supporting act, actor best supporting actor best, he's Academy not, Award he, he's not a lead you're right. right it's not called yeah yeah it's not called uh, I th- I, to be honest with you I think he gets 30 minutes of seat time but of those 30 minutes 24 are, are cacas 
Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is dedication. Yes. I think it's an Oscar winner. You know, performance. I would not have credited uh, Jeff Johns with writing something so experimental. I can't wait to see it. Yes. Um, so, uh, Naboo. With the alloy of the nth metal, as we said, from the Hawkman people. Kaka! He created the Helmet of Fate, the Amulet of Anubis, and the Cloak of Destiny by using the nth metal as a means to tether his existence and his soul to the earthly realm forever. Now, his power was imbued in these objects and were meant to, uh, those who were worthy were meant to, when they had these objects, to serve the Lords of Order with his power. Now, initially, the helmet served as the housing for Naboo's soul after he passed, and it would typically allow him to possess the wearer. And over time, he was restricted eventually to simply advising whoever wears the helmet. And now, Ashley, yes, we have to get to the most important question I have ever asked you on this project, excuse me, this project and this podcast. But first, this. Okay, Ashley, here is the most important question that I have ever asked you in over 430 episodes of Geek History Lesson. Are you ready? Probably not. Do you think the Helmet of Fate looks cool? Yes, it looks so cool. It's so stupid. I love it. <laughs> it's so... It's so stupid. You love it. Look, there's a... Superhero costumes are a really fine line. Mm -hmm. And there is a line where they cross so far into stupid mm -hmm. that they become cool again. Mm -hmm. And that is what the helmet of fate is because it's utterly impractical. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to breathe in there. You'd be, be smooshing your nose. You'd be sweaty. It would be stinky in mm -hmm. there, but people on, wouldn't be able to hear you either. You wouldn't be able to hear nobody. Yeah. Uh, but it looks so awesome. Okay, and, I didn't know. And, it and does look shockingly cool. looks cool in real it, life too. Yeah, it looks really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love the Dr. Fate for a character. I'm not that invested mm -hmm. in a great all time. Great costume for sure. Nice. Thank you. In the 1920s, let's talk about old Kent Nelson, the main wearer, the main doctor. Okay, Fate. I am 1920s. I am visualizing him doing the Charleston. I think it might be slightly earlier than the Charleston. Dun, but dun, 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 now, the archaeologist Sven Nelson and his 12-year-old son, Count Nelson, go on an expedition to explore ancient Mesopotamia. Sven believed that the pyramids were not created by the Egyptians, but by beings from another planet. And while exploring an old temple in the desert, he finds inscriptions in the chamber of history. Now, Kent, his son, because he's 12 and an idiot, wanders off alone. <laughs> I'm not saying that all 12 year olds are, are an idiot, but Kent, mm, let's just say. All right. He finds a fully colored statue of Naboo the Wise, who telepathically signals him to operate a nearby lever. And this lever brings Naboo back to life, but also accidentally releases a poisonous gas that floods the outer temple. As a result, this poisonous gas kills his father, Sven. So why you don't bring children on archaeological digs? That's, That's right. All I'm saying. They're just pulling levers. Now, in repayment for Kent releasing him, Naboo promises to teach the child the secrets of the universe. And it has later been suggested that Naboo manipulated the situation to his advantage. Of course he did. I was like, suggested? Yeah. I was like, not accepted? Well, let's just say that Kent doesn't discover that fact until several years later. Sure. Kent is just like, he's 12. He's like, oh my God. Oh God. In front, You're going to give me a magical powers? Oh, my dad's died. Don't worry. I shall take care of you. Okay. I guess that's okay. Pretty cool cape. You're not going to make me say caca every five minutes, are you? No. I do love a cape. Yes. Um, so he sought out Kent. It has later been just again, like I said, Naboon manipulated the situation to take advantage of this 12-year-old boy so that he could take him on as his apprentice. As you're going to learn throughout this lesson, Naboo is pretty cruel. Mm. Okay. So Kent would serve as an agent of the Lords of Order in the never-ending battle against the Lords of Chaos. And eventually, Kent would grow up. He would grow fond of Naboo, viewing Naboo as the father he had lost. And Naboo ra basically raises Kent. It's probably Naboo. But I'm, I just like saying Naboo. Uh, Naboo uh, uh, rapidly ages this young boy into a young adult. And he teaches him skills such as the levitation and telekinesis and the Charleston. And he was even able to put Kent's aging to a halt so that he could stay a young man forever. And when Kent was ready, he was given the Helmet of Fate, the Amulet of Anubis, and the Cloak of Destiny to become Dr. Fate. Sounds a lot like what Dr. Strange wears. A little bit. Let me tell you about these three. Yes. Uh, so the Cloak of Destiny gives you magical resistance. Chiefly, it is a powerful vestment that is considered to be both 
fireproof and have the ability to suppress strong forms of magic. It's nice to know that it's fireproof. <laughs> yes, it's very fireproof. <laughs> and it keeps away bees, which is good to know. Uh, the the Amulet of Anubis is a circular device that adorns the collar worn around Dr. Fate's chest, and it allows anyone who wears it vast magical abilities, um, basically whatever the writer wants. But some of them are that the amulet contains a pocket universe. It has been known to house souls. It can create a mystical beam. It can protect uh, the wearer from magical detection. It can enhance sorcery. And it has telepathic resistance. And then, of course, there is the Helmet of Fate, which contains the entire knowledge and magical repository of the being known as Naboo. Okie dokie. So, Ashley, you get a yes. choice of these one of these three items. Which are you taking? Uh, I want the de- repository. So you want sure. the Helmet of Fate? For sure. But Naboo might control you. Yeah, but I want to be smart. Okay. I guess I think I'm better than him. Okay. Is what it comes down to. All right. He's a man. I'm genetically superior. I'll be fine. Okay. Uh, well, technically, he's he's a in- non-corporeal being. Then he he would just inhabited the body of a being. Does uh, a he man use for a he while. him pronouns? Uh, I think so. Then he's a man. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So as Kent ventures out into the world, Naboo tells him to head to Alexandria, and there he would find the single secret worth having for a lifetime. On his way, Kent veers off as he's drawn towards some evil entity, and he comes across a vehicle turned on its side with a corpse laid out. And when he investigates, he starts to get in tune with different auras, Mm. and he uses a spell to show him that the presence of the aura he is sensing. And he is shown a woman named Inza Kramer. She is held captive by a local nearby sorcerer named Watan. Now, even though fate has never met either of them, there is a sense of familiarity, and he follows the trail of their auras to find them both. There he stumbles across an abandoned tower, and he is greeted by Watan as Watan exclaims, We meet again, and after all this time, which is a classic comic book thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Watan uses Inza to lure out Dr. Fate, although Watan himself couldn't pinpoint their exact connection. He knew that there is something between Inza and fate. And Kent in his inexperience to face off against Watan, is beaten down and nearly dies. Eep. Inza pleads to him to let fate with, pleads to Watan, and Kent is only here to rescue her. And she, there is no point in beating him, as, as she says. She's like, you don't have to kill him. It's fine. Um, but it is said here that because she has a blind belief and blind compassion in Inza, um, that it actually combines their magical powers and allows them to, it supercharges Kent and allows them both to beat Watan and Mm. defeat him. After winning the battle, Naboo is ready to wipe out Inza's mind from all these recent events. And Inza pleads and says, yo, let me hang out with you, Dr. Fate. It's all good. Because she knew underneath the helmet, there was a young man who needed to be anchored to humanity and not anchored by a lord of order and i bet she thought he was a cutie pie and that didn't hurt either well that's true because the two fell in love and they soon got married that's nice yeah. did they get married in the dark dimension no there is no dark dimension in the dc universe well, that's where all the lasting magical marriages happen as okay. we know from this podcast uh so now we have a wizard and we have his white haired future wife mm. fighting magic again mm. sound familiar mm. in Interesting. So Dr. Fate, not a real doctor, establishes his home base, the Tower of Fate, in Salem, Massachusetts. Hey! I mean, if you're going to do it anywhere in these United States, I guess that's the place, Mm -hmm. huh? Inside this tower, it contains valuable magical artifacts and tomes, and it is actually unknown how many levels it has. But it has no doors and no windows, and only Kent and Inza can enter and leave freely. If anyone, Sounds like my dream home. Mm-hmm, if anyone or anything enters the tower, they can only leave physically by touching the Nelsons. Mm-hmm. Interesting side note, uh, for Inza to have the ability to enter and leave the Tower of Fate, Dr. Fate cast a spell over her, essentially giving the tower the impression that she was Kent. And when doing that, it also directly affected her and stopped her aging just like Kent. Oh, that's interesting. I kind of assumed that because they were married, 
and they were, you know, like spiritually bonded or whatever, that mm. that might be enough. Um, but okay, the man is the one who can open the doors. Mm-hmm. Great. I like the idea that you have to touch one of them to be able to enter or exit. So if they get pissed off at you, they can just shove you and you're gone, mm-hmm. which we've actually seen happen. And a you can of be times. lost in the Tower of Fate forever. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's happened. Um, it becomes like it's like one of the paintings with the upside down stairs. What yeah. You, is uh, it an Escher? Uh, uh, MC Escher, yeah. Yes, there yeah. we go. Uh, now... Kent Nelson became a founding member of the Justice Society of America, which was the team for the Justice League. And at this time, he started to fully understand how controlling Naboo uh, can be when wearing the helmet. In an attempt to curb that control, Kent cut off the bottom of the helmet. This is the period of time where you see uh, Dr. Fate's little mouthy talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But this actually deeply affected his magical powers that have them. Uh, And during this time, the Spectre had gone missing. Now, the Spectre is God's spirit of vengeance, which uh, walks around in a green bikini and a green cloak. Yeah, kind of muddles the whole magic when you mix it with religion like Mm -hmm. that. But that is the rule in the DC universe. But Dr. Fate was the first friend that the Spectre made because they were both founding members of the JSA. And Dr. Fate goes looking for him. And Fate finds out that the Spectre had been under the control of Kulak, who is a evil character in the DC universe. And when they get into the battle, Dr. Fate is overwhelmed and has the helmet of fate taken away from him. Mm. It is during this time that the helmet becomes lost in the netherverse. And Kent takes advantage of the opportunity to retire from being a superhero. He actually becomes a real physician because he's absorbed this knowledge from Naboo. I thought he was not a real doctor. Well, he fakes it at this point. Oh, so he's a real liar, but yes. not a real doctor. Yes, he goes yeah. and finds somebody to just print out a medical certificate, and he just starts, you know, and he's like, oh, I'm a doctor. And Did you also go to upstairs medical clinic? He, he, <laughs> yes, he went to the University of America, Samoa. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but of course, eventually, Naboo finds his way back, and the helmet comes back because comics, and Kent is Dr. Fate again. Although, it was during some of this time, this time when he got the helmet back, that has proved that his, him being Dr. Fate is a challenge for him and Inza, because when he acts like Dr. Fate, this is when he starts acting differently when he has the helmet on. Mm. And Inza starts noticing, and this puts a strain on their relationship. Now, Ashley, yes. depending on the writer, depends on how differently Dr. Fate acts when he has the helmet on. Now, do you like the idea of Dr. Fate being one person who just has magical powers, or the idea that he becomes a different person when combined into one. Uh, certainly narratively, it's much more interesting if he becomes a different person mm-hmm. when he's combined into one. And when you have sort of the push pull of what that means in the DC universe, we see a couple of examples of this as well. Um, ironically, a lot from other characters that they have purchased from other companies. Uh, Shazam obviously being the most obvious one that comes to mind. Well, Young Justice deals with this a lot. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whereas it's funny because I think just like the anime series completely ignores this. Yes. Um, and the J- uh, Jeff Johns JSA also deals with uh, mm-hmm. that, particularly when it comes to Shazam. Sam and Billy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think narratively, I think there's a lot more story potential if that is the case. But I'm assuming in the film that will not be the case. I don't know. I'm assuming he will just get superpowers when he puts the helmet we on. We don't know. And at the time of this podcast, when you're, if you've already seen Black Adam, you're laughing at us for whatever we know. And we don't care. Yep. Because we can't predict the future. Well, sometimes we can. Maybe we can if we have the de- Helmet of Fate. There we go. Anyway, speaking of the Helmet of Fate, the Helmet of Fate was catastrophically changed by the events in Crisis on Infinite Earths because there was a fundamental shift that changed all reality. Ashley, what is Crisis on Infinite Earths, our favorite subject? So in 1985, DC was like, oh, there's so many Earths. And so they created the Anti-Monitor and he went num, 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 and ate up all the Earths and then he farted out only one universe and... Uh, most of the characters got a reboot or a streamlining of their origin. Because of the shift in the universe and the multiverse, there was a shift in the balance of magic in the DCU multiverse. Kent Nelson, uh, he and Inza were able to keep their youthful age pre-Christ and Infinite Earths, but post, they were aging rapidly. Whoa. Uh, And later that year, the strain was unbearable on Inza, so she committed suicide. In her suicide, what devastated Kent and nearly caused him to commit suicide as well. But Nabu would not allow Kent to die uh, because he needed a new doctor fate because Kent was unable to accomplish the job in his current grieving. Now, Nabu is living inside Kent's body at this point instead of the helmet. And he doesn't have much use for Kent because he's an old man. So 
Naboo is like, we got to find successor and we got to find a successor too sweet because again, as I said, Naboo is cruel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now we then meet the characters, Eric and Linda Strauss. Eric is a 10 year old boy who was looked after by his stepmom, Linda and Eric had an abusive father and his mother died when he was young. His father married Linda who was only interested in him for his wealth. Now, regardless of her intentions as a gold digger, she generally cares for Eric. And she feels there's this unexplained bond between the two of them. Eric's father passes away, and Linda becomes Eric's guardian. Now, while they're at the park, Kent Nelson approaches Eric and says, Hey, man, you want some candy? Sure. <laughs> Actually, he what said, What kind of candy? Uh, Werther's Originals. Sure. Because he's an old man. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I was going to be like. Also, Ken Nelson is a, is, is, it what, is candy. a greatest generation. He's not even a boomer. He's the greatest generation. Wow. He's a World War II guy. Yeah, yeah, Um, No, Kent Nelson actually approaches Eric and says, hey, do you want to see the Tower of Fate? Um, and, and by that, I mean the giant tower with no windows that I live in. Yeah, yeah, that's invisible. Yeah. And despite how dicey and inappropriate these circumstances are, Eric gets this unspoken sense that deep down he's been waiting for this moment. It's like premonition that he knew he was destined for something more. So he trusts Kent Nelson and goes with them. But and, and, and luckily this instinct is correct. And luckily the Kent Nelson is not a creeper. And Eric <laughs> is actually chosen to be the new Dr. Fate. Nabu, like Kent, rapidly ages Eric up into adulthood for his training, and his training consists of being thrown right into battle immediately against an agent for the Lords of Chaos named Typhoon. Or cool. Typhoon. I don't know how you say it. Uh, I've never heard it said aloud. It's fiction. It's fine. That's right. Nabu guides Eric through the battle until suddenly he abandons him at a critical point just to see if Eric can handle himself because, again, Nabu is cruel. Well, a lot of these ancient forces <laughs> tend to be... Yep. The battle ends in disaster as Eric is separated from the helmet of fate. And because he is aged so rapidly, mentally, he has a tough time processing this because he's still a 12 year old boy. Sure, 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 sure. So he wanders around aimlessly, really with some serious PTSD. The cops find him and Eric Strauss is sentenced to live in Arkham Asylum. Okay. Yeah. Because of these events. Seems harsh. Yeah. <laughs> because of these events, Kent starts to challenge Naboo because of these very questionable actions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Kent starts to realize like, hey, wait a minute. Did you maybe have something to do with the death of my father? Did you convince me to pull that lever that, that, that farted out the ancient gas that killed my dad? Took him long enough. <laughs> it took him about 80 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he even suggested, he was like, was my father always pre preordained to die in order for me to become Dr. Fate? But what really gets at him is the circumstances behind Inza's death. And he's like, hey, did you have something to do with Inza killing herself did, because you wanted Eric instead of me? Is this all part of your plan? I don't know if I like you anymore, Naboo. <laughs> and Naboo's like, I don't care. Uh... <laughs> So, yeah, basically. So <laughs> Kent starts challenging everything. The methodology of Naboo, the fact that he takes control of a human hoist, a human hoist and a host. And he starts pointing out that his actions for the sake of order and good are, in fact, evil. Suddenly, the Godhead, another of the Lords of Order, mm -hmm. appears. And they surmise that Naboo isn't actually evil. Naboo is just tainted by its experience with humanity. Oh, okay. Think that makes you evil. For the time that Naboo has spent on Earth, his decision-making is too human. So the Godhead suggests that Naboo leaves Earth. But you see, Naboo is too tainted by humanity that Naboo is like, uh-uh, I ain't going. I'm staying. I like Earth too much. I mean, that is a really human reaction to be like, no, you can't make me. Basically. Now, Linda. Yeah. Remember her? Eric's guardian. Yes. Has been wandering around this park being like, where are you <laughs> for days? <laughs> where? Where did you go, Eric? Uh, actually, Seems like a poor guardian. Actually, it's a much shorter time frame than that. But she finds she her, and Bruce Wayne can get together yeah. and discuss child she, rearing. She finds her way into the Tower of Fate, claiming that she also followed her instincts, that something drew her to the Tower of Fate. Mm. Now, eventually, Eric gets released from Arkham Asylum uh, because his mind finally becomes clear and he's managed to adjust to this sudden 
body growth and mental growth. And he accepts the responsibility. And he's like, I think I'm supposed to be Dr. Fate. I'm, I think I'm actually supposed to do this. And Eric finds Linda at the tower of fate and Kent realizes their connection and what it could mean for the role of Dr. Fate. But Naboo refuses to see it and says, only Eric, only the man can become the new host. Ugh, okay. When suddenly our new favorite villain, and Ashley's favorite naming convention, Anti-Fate appears. It's so dumb. Now, Anti-Fate, this is the late 80s, by the way. Uh -huh. Anti-Fate is an agent of chaos sent to counter Dr. Fate and looks exactly like Dr. Fate, just mixed in with a bunch of Todd McFarlane mannerisms. I'm literally imagining in Scott Pilgrim when he defeats Gideon, and then he's like, now you have to fight Nega Scott. Kind of, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Imagine like- A an, dark mirror of yourself. Yeah, yeah. like it, it's lots of points, a lot of spikes- but, I'm going to literally just look it up. But still like yellow and still has the helmet of fate kind of an anti -fate idea. Anti-fate DC comics. Yep. Go on. Now, anti-fate faces off against the Justice League International because this was the time the Justice League International, which Dr. Fate was a member of. And he looks so Todd McFarlane. -y. Yep. He looks cool, though. Very cool. And anti-fate defeats all of the Justice League International. Yep, yep, yep. And he creates a path of chaos and destruction as he moves towards Egypt. As his power and power sure, increases. Sure, that makes sense. Yep. Kind of echoing back to the original narrative. We yep. love to see it. Anti-Fate throws a bunch of spells that should have annihilated Eric. But Kent eventually figures out what has happened. He realizes that all along, Naboo got it wrong. Dr. Fate was never meant to be one person. Dr. Fate was meant to be two people. This was what was always supposed to happen between him and Inza. It's that strong spiritual and mystical connection. This is what has drawn Linda and Eric together. Mm. And this, it is Linda's inherent subconscious magic that is protecting Eric from anti-fate. And Naboo was never meant to take control. He was only meant to sort of be a knowledgeable voice that these two people could hear mm -hmm. on how to utilize and release their power, sort of how to guide them to be better humans. Uh, Kent tells all this to Linda, uh, but Naboo, and he, and he also sees, he also says like, hey, Linda, you should go to Eric. Naboo places a barrier in between Linda and Eric to stop her. Okay. And Kent asserts that Naboo must be so obsessed with control that he would rather let chaos reign over order. And Naboo's like, ah, I guess you're right. And he drops the barrier down, turning Linda into pure energy as they merge with Eric and not one, but two people meet their destiny and become Dr. Fate. The end. Well, not quite. <laughs> but the merging Dr. Fate vanquished Anthony Fate and Dr. Fate reclaims his helmet as more formidable than ever. Afterward, everyone returns to Tower of Fate. They have tea and cookies cookies and crumpets and Kent decides he's like, I, you know what? I just, I, I'm done. I'm, I kind of run a retire. Also, I'm like 90 by yep. this point. Also, my I'm wife's honored. dead. Uh, and Eric and Linda ask him to stay to mentor the journey. But Kent asks Naboo to let his body go so that he can die naturally. And when he does, he dies naturally. And Eric and Linda bury Kent outside the tower of fate. The uh, end. No, not the <laughs> end yet. Stop, Ashley. <laughs> Naboo is brought forth to the Lords of Order, and they decide that he is no longer fit to remain on Earth as he has lost his true purpose serving Order. Um, and Ken's sacrifice actually humbled Naboo. He's like, you know, there's more to life than just order and chaos. Like, there's Doritos, and there's, like, at rapidly aging kids up, you know, to maturity. There's lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but Naboo refuses again to leave Earth, and he wants to fight against Dr. Fate. So, or he, excuse me, he wants to fight with Dr. Fate. So the Lords of Order agree to Naboo's wishes. And as a result, he is exiled from the Lords of Order's realm to never return. And after returning, Naboo takes possession of Kent's body. Yep, like a walking zombie. Yep, yep. Um, because he agrees to no longer take control of Eric or Linda as Dr. Fate. And he thinks, well, perhaps living a life as a person will keep him grounded and he can become the mystical teacher that he was always supposed to be. So even in death... Kent Nelson cannot rest because Kent Nelson isn't quite done yet, but there are some more Dr. Fates out there, everybody. So just relax and let me tell you a little bit more about them. So from this point forward, the persona and the wearer of Dr. Fate is going to shift a lot. Um, so I want to ask you this, Ashley, what do you yes. think about Dr. Fate being one of these characters kind of like Green Lanterns that there's so many people that are Dr. Fate like they're, Kent Nelson is the most well-known person, but I'm going to give, like I said, there have been eight Dr. Fates. Uh, there, that's too many. 
There's mm-hmm. also too many Green Lanterns. There's too many Earthbound Green Lanterns specifically. Um, I don't. I don't love it. It's fine. Um, but I also think at this point we have this inevitability in DC Comics having been around for 80 years at this point. Like we're going to become saturated with characters. That's the perpetual second act of comics, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So Eric and Linda, they're Dr. Fate now. Yeah. Well, they die. I Eric- know a real life couple named Eric and Linda. And it really throws me every time you say that. Do you want them to be Dr. Fate? Uh, sure. Let's, fine. Let's call them on the phone. Let's make them the offer. Great. All right. I mean, they're both in their sixties. So. Well, they're going to die. Okay. As Dr. Fate. Okay. That's their, that's their, that's their fate. I'm not as into that, but yeah. we'll see. Maybe. Uh, but you know, eventually their souls get to reincarnate as a normal couple. So they get to live on their lives normally. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, for a short period, Kent and Inza come back, but in their younger bodies and only Inza is able to wear the helmet. So this is where we get the female Dr. Fate for a while that you might've yeah, seen yeah, on covers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we then get to zero hour and the villain extant forcibly separates the artifacts away from Dr. Fate, robbing their power and condemning both Kent and Inza back to the true age, which at this point would have been around, you know, 90. And uh, I'm just trying to imagine my grandmother with the, mm-hmm. with the powers of Dr. Yeah. Fate. So Kent calls in the assistance of a mercenary known as Jared Stevens to retrieve those artifacts back. Ah, uh, yes. Jared, the name that is always evoked when I think of a mercenary. Yeah. Jared gets the items back back but not before kent and inza die Mm. and jared takes the helmet of fate melts it down and turns it into a dagger because he's fate and that's what's called a callback students that's right uh so jared stevens fate it's the extreme 90s. He is cursed with a wicked cool tattoo that allows him to cast magic. And the super new awesome doctor character, he's only going to be known as Fate. He honestly, I've just Googled a photo of him, looks yeah. sillier than anti-Fate looked. Oh, yeah. He has a mullet, too. Yeah, and, and like half of, a, of his hair a, is red. A jumpsuit. Yeah. He's fate. Very <laughs> I don't have a guitar sound effect, everybody. And he kind of has like a bishop like thing, like the onk over his eye. That's very, how he casts spells. Very silly. Fate, fate, fate. Very silly. Yeah. It's the 90s, baby. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, Vijay and I both have love-hate relationships with mm-hmm. the 90s comics. Yeah. Uh... Unfortunately, Jared wasn't cool enough to last because he's murdered by the wizard Mordrew. Mordrew! Uh, leaving the mantle alone once more. However, Naboo was just sick of the 90s. Yeah. And he reconstitutes the artifacts into a less extreme, uncool original form. So we get the helmet of fate again. Yeah. Uh, the next Doctor Fate was claimed by Hector Hall, the son of Carter and Shira Hall. Okay. They are the original Golden Age Hawkman and Hawk. Hawk people, yeah. And like his parents, he sort of goes through a cycle of reincarnation. He served as the main Doctor Fate during the JSA series in the late 90s, written by Jeff Johns. Yeah. Uh, he has a kind of a cool Egyptian headdress. They're made to look like yes, cool very figures. cool, yeah. Uh, of him. Uh, in fact, uh, I think we can pull in one of these. <gasps> Action figure spotlight. Action figure spotlight. Uh, back in the day, there was a great action figure series called DC Universe Classics, and they made two versions of Doctor Fate. They made the Golden Age Doctor Fate, but they also made Hector Hall. And you can tell the difference; they were variants because the Hector Hall version had sort of the more Egyptian collar, whereas Hector has like the more just normal folded over T-shirt collar, uh, or a, a, excuse me, a like a formal dress shirt collar. Is Hector Hall the character in Sandman? Hmm. Ashley, you might be onto something. Oh, okay. I was like, am I but making a uh, false association? But let's wait on that. Okay, great. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. Uh, but you're, let's just say your assumptions are correct. Yay, um, I have a good brain thing. So, again, Hector Hall is the Dr. Fate of the ni- uh, excuse me, the late 90s, early 2000s JSA. Mm-hmm. He is guided by Kent and Inza as spirits who talk to him inside the amulet of Anubis. Uh, and eventually, Naboo comes back. But, you know, he's, of course, cruel, as always. Right. During this series, Black Adam establishes a stronghold in the nation of Kandak. And Naboo takes control of Dr. Fate out of loyalty 
to Black Adam. Because if you remember when Naboo was a human, he had a friend named Teth Adam. Hey. Who is Teth Adam? Black Adam with the pointy ears. Yes. So Naboo takes control of Hector to be like, I'm going to go help out my old pal from mm -hmm. 3500 BC. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. looks like Dwayne Johnson and apparently he's going to change the hierarchy of the power in something, something. Yeah, and Coffrey was around and he had a whole pyramid built to him. What yeah. could possibly go wrong? So, since they were allies in ancient Egypt, uh -huh. um, Hector and the Nelsons sort of become these spirits in the amulet of Anubis. And they have to trap Naboo in the amulet of Anubis to give Hector control of his body back. Basically, by doing this, it gives the JSA the advantage. And it's the only thing that allows them to defeat Black Adam during this battle. Mm. Now... This is something I don't know if you've seen the movie at this time. Cool. This is something that I could see the movie playing on. Interesting. So just want to throw that out there. That's where that comes from. Cool. cool, cool. Uh, eventually in the event Day of Vengeance, the Spectre, uh, you know, Dr. Fate's old friend, uh, he goes on a rampage to destroy all magic. Yep. Uh, and Hector and his wife, Lyta, are trapped on a frozen mountain fighting a bunch of demons like you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not going to make it. It yeah. is bad. It's really, really bad. Really? Now, Hector's wife, Lyta, uh, she communicates with her son, Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, now, why is this important? Well, if you've read Neil Gaiman's Sandman or you've seen the Netflix show Sandman, there are spoilers here. Mm -hmm. So if you do not want to know any spoilers to possibly the Netflix Sandman show, or the Neil Gaiman Sandman show, you're going to want to fast forward probably about two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right, there's your spoiler warning. Lyda communicates with her son, Daniel, who is the late 90s Lord of the Dreaming after Morpheus. Mm -hmm. Daniel is the person that replaces Morpheus. Daniel proposes to his mom and her husband that they join him in the dreaming. Um, and... Lyda takes him up on this offer and together with Hector, they enter the portal of the dreaming as their physical bodies die on that mountaintop, but they are forever safe and home living in the dreaming for the rest of history with Daniel, the Lord of dreams. Mm, okay. So I will. Right. So Lyda and Hector get a happy ending. That's nice. Uh, but there you go. But in case, you know, you know there, you, like I said, that, that I'm going to assume is going to be the ending of the Netflix TV show. So there you go. And we're not going to talk about that anymore. Uh, so Naboo, Yay! He's free! He's like, hey, they're he, dead! I'm gonna go hang out with the Gungans, everything's gonna be uh -huh. so good. He takes possession of the artifacts. Yes. And he poses as Dr. Fate, but with no human host. And during this, he's like, hey, hey, I'm Dr. Fate, I'm Naboo, I'm Dr. Fate. He does like a Peter Parker in Spider-Man 3-esque yep. dance. Yes, he does. Get on up! You know, that song. Yes, he does that, except I'm Dr. Fate. And the Spectre immediately kills him. Okie dokie. Just completely obliterates Naboo. Murder, murder, yep. murder. Or Naboo. Whatever. Uh, so the helmet of fate during this time is in limbo uh, until it's found in a dumpster. And it was discovered by a psychiatrist known as Kent V. Nelson. That's right. You guessed it. The grandnephew of Kent Nelson. And Ken, <laughs> Ken, I definitely guess that <laughs> Kent V. Nelson really isn't that important, really doesn't do anything. And he serves as Dr. Fate until the new 52. Hey, which is what, Ashley? So in like 2010, DC was like, oh, God, there's so much continuity. We need to streamline this continuity. And so basically what they did is they took everything back to zero, except for the stuff that they didn't want to. Usually because Jeff Johns was writing it. Everyone got more lines on their costumes. Barry Allen ran back in time, restarted the timeline. And uh, some characters got rebooted, and Dr. Fate was one of them. That was a more detailed explanation of the New 52 than I think anybody ever needed, but thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, in the New 52, we finally have Khalid Nassour. He is an Egyptian-American medical student who was chosen by the Egyptian gods to act as Dr. Fate in the New 52. And his great uncle is none other than Kent Nelson, who is alive and well in this time period. Uh, in this era, he was Dr. Fate, and he has since retired, and he serves as a mentor to Khalid, and he teaches him the ways of magic um after you know the events of flash forward where wally west sits on the mobius chair and he fixes continuity he merges all the various timelines and thus uh fate 
is restored as a member of the JSA during this timeline. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of the last time we see Khalid. There's also an Earth 2 version of Dr. Fate during yeah. this time. Who is Kent Nelson? But I'm going to skip past all of those because we have to talk about the most important version of Dr. Fate. If there's anything else you know about Dr. Fate, you need to know about this character. Uh, actually, there's a phone call coming in for you. Okay, I'll pick it up. I think pick it up for this one. Okay. Hello, Geek History Lesson. Hello. I, an oracle, told me that it was fate. You were talking about fate. It is I, the American version of Dr. Strange Fate. What? Yes, do you know? Oh, no, are you an amalgam character? I am the amalgam character. That is why I sound American. And I can... I'm sorry, you, you've you tripped my security and alarm. I, I don't think I can let you in the building. That's why I can make crickets up here. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm Dr. Strange Fate. I am, you know, the combination of, you know, I can see through the universes. So I can see, you know, that I'm a combination of Dr. Strange and Dr. Fate, and I am here. That's why I don't sound British. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yes, it's, but it's I really am me, actually. Dr. Strange Fate! Do you have a wife? No, I do not have a wife because Dr. Strange has a wife. I do not. Okay. See, okay. Dr. Fate has a wife. Dr. Strange has a wife. Dr. Strange Fate has no wife. You also sound like you might have, like, Yahoo ridden an atomic bomb at some point. <laughs> You mean like slim pickings? Yeah. yeah. See, in my universe, it was not a cowboy that wrote the bomb. It was, of course, a medical doctor. See, in my universe, everything is opposite. Are you a medical doctor? No. Okay. I just call myself Dr. Strange Fate. Uh, Okay. That seems presumptuous considering people go through medical school. Actually, I have come here to give you. Why are you here? I've come to give you your fate. Okay. Hit me, baby. Uh, uh, Here we go. So... All right, here we go. An oracle once told me it was fate that I had banged my leg into a table at school. I guess it was my desk to knee. Oh, boy. Did you, did you know I retired from marine biology today? No. Now my life has no porpoise. Boodoom. <laughs> Do you think fate, I think we need to bring the crickets back. Do you think fate brought me on this podcast or was it bad luck? No, it was Jason. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he left. Fate can be a cool lady. I guess that's why it's called misfortune. Thank you. I'll be here all week. This has been Dr. Strange Fate. <laughs> I like the idea of uh, Doctor Strange Fate being like a super, super mediocre uh, stand-up comic in front of one of those brick walls in New York. <laughs> like Doctor Strange Fate's kind of lame, but he's also kind of cool. Like I, I'm back like now. Most amount. Doctor Strange Fate just walked. Uh, yeah, 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 he just yeah. hung off the phone. You are lucky that you missed him. Yeah, he doesn't sound cool. No, he's not cool at all. No. I mean, maybe he is. I don't think I've read that amalgam. He's got a cool costume. Okay. Yeah. It seems to be. That seems to be. You didn't expect Doctor Strange Fate to make an appearance in this podcast. Did I you? did not remember he existed before this very second, so uh, I did, certainly did not. So Doctor Strange Fate, of course, is from Amalgam Comics. He's created by Ron Mars and uh, Jose Luis Garcia. It is the combination of Marvel and DC Comics when they did that event, and it's a, he's a combination of Doctor Strange and Doctor Fate. Mm-hmm. Uh, his real name is actually Charles Xavier. And here's his origin. I almost swore. <laughs> when when traveling through the Himalayas as a meta mutant amalgam, Xavier was rescued by Naboo, the Ancient One, who was a Lord Supreme of the Order of the Amalgam Universe. My brain hurts. Xavier was taught the mysteries of the supernatural world, taught to tap into the energies of both the telepathic and the mystical fortunes, for, forces. Excuse me. He's given the cloak of levitation, the all-seeing eye, the staff of power, the helmet of strange fate, and thus Charles Xavier became dr strange fate he is also a meta mutant telepath and he soon surpasses his teacher and he becomes a founding member of the judgment league avengers uh strange fate is not a typical hero he preferred to stay at home no kidding he preferred (laughs) to stay at home in his sanctum the tower of strange fate and orchestrate events from a distance for example he takes on a supervillain named big question aka edward nigma fisk and gets him elected as the mayor of new gotham city 
and he uses him as a puppet to do his bidding. But eventually, the big twist of Doctor Strange Fate is that he learned about the two universes that preceded the ones he lived in, and the man that was called Access had the key to restoring them back. Access is a main character of DC versus Marvel, and he knew that Access could destroy the Amalgam universe. So... Strange Fate basically tried to stop him from doing that. But, however, the DC and the Marvel universes were restored. But, however, Doctor Strange Fate did survive. And his consciousness found its way to become a part of Doctor Strange's subconscious. And usually, when the two, uh, when two universes would meet or would happen, you know, and this, Doctor Strange Fate would get to appear again. So, he's okay. only here a couple more times. I feel like you... As the person explaining this to me, slash yes. the, the editors who created this, yes. took a bunch of words from DC and Marvel, That's exactly right. shook them up in a bowl, and threw them at the wall, and whatever stuck became this character. Oh, yeah? There were just so many words, and I was like, I know what these words mean, but when you put them all together like that, they just don't mean as, they just, the meaning is lost on me. It, it does get a little bit, it, it a, a little jumbly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. And it's not because you did a poor job explaining it, I don't mean to, I just mean like, it, it, it feels like making him Charles Xavier, that's like a level too deep. Just mashing up Strange and Fate is honestly cool well, enough. The and the name Strange Fate is cool. And also the costume is really cool because it's the Doctor Strange costume with the with the oh, I've already helmet of Fate it. on top. Yeah, it it's looks really great. great. Yeah. It's one that deserves to, uh, I think, have a action figure. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Um, but, you know, Doctor Strange Fate. Uh, I could not not do an episode on Doctor Fate without talking about Doctor Strange. Well, legitimately, when when else would we ever evoke the man? Oh, there's a phone coming in for you, Ashley. Okay, well, you better leave the room so I can pick it up. Hello, Hello? it's Doctor Strange. Oh, thank God! I remembered a joke. Okay. I was driving home in my Kia, and I have a joke. Okay, ready? Yeah. What ultimately decides your fate while you are driving? Your karma. <laughs> uh, you know, I Dr. Strange Fate. I would think after the accident that you wouldn't be a fan of driving. Oh, I didn't have my accident in a car. That's not what happened. Okay, I don't need to know. Goodbye. Well, I'm Charles Click. Xavier. Oh, Click. Wait, I, Click. I have more. Click. I have one more joke. Click. <laughs> you can't hang up on me. Click. I'm a magical. All right, I'll leave. I get the message. Okay, fine. I'll just show up the next time you talk about an amalgam. Okay. <laughs> Only if Jason remembers. <laughs> bits on bits on bits. <laughs> Click. Wow, he came back. Yeah, I hope he never comes back again. <laughs> He's, wow, you hate Dr. Strange Fate that much? My goal for the rest of this year is to start as many fights with with guest characters. Yeah, listeners, if you don't listen to GHL Lecture, you might not know that Ashley currently has a cold war with Tex Willerman going on. I will say, shout out to the Discord level patrons because yeah. everyone is on my side That's right. with that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I am in the right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Ashley, uh, let's. that's it for Dr. Fate. Yeah. I hope that was a fun lesson. I know it was a little bit, I know magical lessons are a little hard. They are. Uh, uh, but I we're thought, all over the place. I thought that was great. And my kudos to both you and Diego for making that even kind of comprehensible. There you go. Let's get to the recommended reading. What's that? That is where if you were touched by an angel, that is Jason Inman, as he explained anything to you on this podcast, if you head over to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading, you can pick up some recommendations on the coolest reading you can do about Dr. Fate. And I'm actually really interested in what these are because I haven't done a lot of reading on Dr. Fate. So, Jason, hit me with them. Well, the first one is kind of an out-of-print book, but I'm going to put it on here anyway. It's the Golden Age Doctor Fate Archives, Volume 1. Okay. Uh, it is woefully out of print, but uh, the Golden Age adventures of Doctor Fate are the good adventures, so I'm going to throw that out there. Uh, the next one is Doctor Fate, Volume 1, The Blood Price. Uh, this is Khalid's book. I like Khalid. I do. This is a fun collection. Um, this is the one I've read. Also, it's uh, Doctor Fate in a hoodie, which is kind of a cool visual. It is. Um, it's not the best Doctor Fate series, but like I think it's a really smart revamp of the character and i would totally be fine if like khalid was the dr fate of the, the dc universe going forward mm -hmm. um the last one is jsa by jeff johns book one now this mostly deals with the jsa and it's not towards the end of this that they start dealing with hector hall uh dr fate um because the new dr fate is created in this book series so um jsa by jeff johns is 
one of the best DC comic series of all time. Absolutely. Um, so I highly recommend it no matter what. You're also going to get lots of Black Adam in there. So I, e- even if this is before the Dr. Fate stuff, read it anyway. Yeah. So there you I go. Would, I would definitely agree. You will not, the wait will be worth it. You will not be disappointed. Mm-hmm. So uh, there you go. And now it's time to move into the honor roll. That is where if you go over to Apple Podcasts and you write five stars, we'll read whatever you write. And if you are a nice international listener, please send us a screenshot because we cannot access international Apple Podcasts. Send the email to geekhistorylesson at gmail.com. Let us know where you're from because we want to make sure that you are repped on this podcast as well. Mm-hmm. So who's joining the honor roll today? Ashley Bongo the Bean Man. What kind of, <laughs> I love that name. What kind of beans, though, bud? Let me know. Yeah. Uh, it says thank you. As someone who absolutely loves comics but doesn't really have the time to read them, this is an absolutely amazing podcast to listen to during my commute or while working. Oh, cool! I love being able to learn more about my favorite characters in such an accessible way. Jason and Ashley are phenomenal hosts and great writers. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank them for what is now my absolute favorite podcast. Oh, thank you. Very nice. So let's welcome Bongo the Bean Man into the teacher's lounge. And what is going on in there today, Jason? Well, in the teacher's lounge, it's Dr. Strange, babe! Let me guess. He's teaching joke structure? Yes, comedy writing? I am in here to tell more jokes. What's the difference between a near-death experience and a booty call? Oh, boy. I wish I was having one of those right now. One is ducking fate, and the other is... Wow. Wow. Put it together, kids. We have an E for everyone rating. <laughs> not unless you, if you, not, if you don't understand what that is, you don't understand what it is. Uh, if you're here, an actual child, tweet us at Change the Podcast. <laughs> there's nothing uncouth in that. You just got to put it together. <laughs> Here's another one for you. I still can't believe how the pastry chef died. It's hard to believe a cruller fate. Oh, my God. I'll be here all week. And I'm probably going to be sleeping in that sleeping bag. Somebody left yeah, a sleeping bag it, in this the is a, this is I'm a, gonna, a. I'm going to take that. This is, a, gonna, this I, is I, a university, so I, this is an mm, open mic, so mm, we can't make you leave. But yes. you don't have to get up every night and perform. Somebody with the initials JS left a sleeping bag. I think I'm going to get in it right now, and I'm just not going to leave. Okay, so well, I think we it might be occupied. You no, know, it's empty right now. Okay. He's out looking for action figures. I'm certain of it. Oh, yeah, that, that yep. actually sounds correct. Yep, I'm going to get him. Well, there you go, Ashley. Okay. That's what's happening in the Mine University Lounge. Yeah. I, I don't know if we're ever going to go back. Who knows? <laughs> we may never go back to the teacher's lounge Who now. knows? I, um, I, look, I did not expect the hatred towards Dr. Strange Fate. <laughs> You thought those jokes were going to go over well? No, I thought he might just be an enjoyable character, but uh, <laughs> we have we have like built a wall up against it. This guy is just trying his best. He doesn't know that he's from two Smash universes. He doesn't know. Actually, he does know, but he's just trying his best. Okay. Sometimes your best isn't good enough. Wow, thanks for that improv. Uh, <laughs> yes, and Ashley. You can really tell you've taken more improv classes than me, huh? One okay. of us graduated from UCB and one of us is good at improv. That's right. <laughs> uh, all right, Ashley. Uh, don't forget, listeners out there, you can follow and listen to us and subscribe to us wherever you find us on podcasts. Uh, you can find Ashley on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V. Robinson. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. And don't forget, we're going to rank the magic users of the DC Universe over at patreon.com slash Jawin. So go check that out. Um, by the way, we, we've we been... Hashtag stick around. We've been wrapping up. We did a giant contest with our listeners uh, gumming for uh, sound effects for the hashtag stick around segment. And it's time to announce the winner... And without further ado, here is now the ongoing hashtag stick around sound effect. Stick around. Pedro Nuno Lopez. Thank you so much. Congrats. Uh, you are the winner. We'll be uh, reaching out to you to uh, send you your prizes. Uh, hashtag stick around this week. Ashley. Yes. Why are so many magical people called doctor? That's a great question. Is there more than two? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. How many is so? Doctor Spectrum. I don't know who that is. <laughs> is from the Squadron Supreme. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know how much Squadron Supreme, my friend. None. Stop uh, ducking the topic and answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would pause it because we like to think that magic 
is something that has to be well studied. Magic is just science your people don't understand yet. And that, I hate that. <laughs> and that one. That's a terrible tour. <laughs> I know, it's very much like Sean Connery. Yeah, it's very Sean Connery. Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved to see I'm Sean from Connery Asgard. play Thor. <laughs> I'm Thor. Very funny. I'll take another. Smoking a cigarette while he does it. Father. Um, I think it's the idea, right, that one dedicates themselves to study because we know magic and religion obviously tied very closely. Mm -hmm. um, but also magic and medicine tied very closely as well uh, throughout human history. So I think I think it's a very apt comparison to be like this person mastered science. The sort of mirror to that would be them mastering magic as well. I think it's the opposite of tract theory. I think it's the idea of putting something very based in the science, mixing it with something very much of chaos. That would be my idea. I think the, the question is more, why are there so many male magic users when magic is something that's usually narratively very feminine? There are a lot of uh, female magic users. Yes, but all of them. They're most, not usually title characters. All, that, that is exactly. inherent. That's inherent in the system, though. Well, that's patriarchy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but like, you know, Zatanna hasn't had as many series as Doctor Strange or... John Constantine, you know, Madame Xanadu, Scarlet Witch. Scarlet Witch maybe might be getting closer now, but yeah, that for me is very interesting. Okay, cool. All right, thank you so much for listening to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Yellow Helmet Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And, uh, you know, as as a way of extending an olive branch, I would <laughs> like to invite Dr. Strange Fate to close out the podcast. I don't think he's coming back. Okay, well, that's fine. I no don't problem. Th I think he's done. Okay. I think, I, again, he's, we left him in the teacher's lounge. I think he's done. He laid down in the teacher's lounge. Yeah, he's probably asleep right now. I mean, he you know, he maybe he's looking up more jokes. Um... Uh, you know, all right, you know, okay, I'll see, I'll see. Hey, Dr. Strange Faye. Yeah, she wants you on the show. No, I, I know, she does, she does. No, come on, come on, here, come on, in. here, here's the mic, here's the mic. <laughs> Hello. Hi, would you like to dismiss the class? Do you want me to? I would love you to. It would mean a lot to me if you did it. Okay. Um... Can I, can I tell a joke when I'm doing it? You can do whatever you want. I can! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Including All right. making everybody rip their headphones off their heads. Look, this podcast, I'm very certain, 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 certain is balanced. So if your volume is at an appropriate level, <laughs> nothing peaks. That's how audience ba audio balancing works. And if and and if it don't, that's your headphones, not the audio file. <laughs> Balance your podcast, everybody. Okay. Uh, here we go. All right. All right. All right. I'm ready. Here we go. All right. All right. There's a man and a woman, right? Yeah. The man says, "Do you think it was fate which brought us together?" And the woman goes, "Nah, it was plain bad luck." Ha <laughs> Do you want a funny limerick? Yes. Okay. There was once a person named Ned who had nary a hair on his head. He patted his pate and bemoaned his fate and went to hide under his bed. That's not bad, actually. Oh, this my. That's pretty good. By sweet Naboo, she <laughs> likes it. <laughs> Dr. Strange Fate is back, baby. She's a sucker for poetry, so bring more poetry next time. All right. Dr. Strange Fate is uh, closing out the class, probably for the last time ever. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>